All right, thank you for joining us. I'm Dana Collinson. I'm the Director of Marketing and Special Events for the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. Welcome to the last community lecture in our 2021 series. We do have a 2022 series coming out, which you may have uh, received the flyer when you got your reminder about tonight's email. So feel free to have a look at that and register now for any lectures you may be interested in for 2022. And we will of course send out reminders before each lecture. So you don't have to remember yourself. Um, tonight, we are talking about vision therapies for keratoconus, and our speakers tonight are uh, Dr. Marjan Farid, talking about cross-linking and corneal transplantation, and Dr. Tan Mai, who um, comes to us from Insight Vision in Costa Mesa, and he will be talking about the latest in contact lens treat technology. Um, we'll have you all on mute. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. They'll be addressed at the end of each of the two lectures. Um, and so we, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Mai. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dana. I appreciate the opportunity to participate and I'm really excited to talk about conic lenses and especially how we can help patients with keratoconus, which is one of my big passions. A little bit about my office. We're in Costa Mesa. We're just about we're less than 10 minutes away from the Gavin Eye Institute. And this is me with a couple of other docs and we just love working with our lovely patients. These are patients that I've seen with either they've had uh, keratoconus, they have post uh, surgical ectasias, and they have issues with their corneas where they really need uh, contact lenses that are especially designed for them. And uh, honestly, it's life changing. And uh, I have a patient uh, once a month or so that cries in the chair. They're just happy that they can see so well finally. And it's really my, um, my one of my biggest passions in my life. And I love coming to work. My average day is uh, a patient like this here. Uh, he comes in and he says, hi, you're, you're optometrist number six this year. <laughs> Not even just like over the last couple of years, but just even this year, I've kind of come, come and gone around the, the gamut. And I love seeing these patients because I, I will, I, I, I don't um, dish my patients off. I go for it. And uh, if, if they can be fit with the lens, we're going to do it at our office. And uh, I'm happy to say we nailed it with him and he's pretty happy. Now, of course, you might have heard of normal soft contact lenses for normal corneas. You know, you might see commercial for acuoasis, infused, biofinity, things of that nature. But patients with keratoconus usually require more than just the, the run of the mill soft contact lenses. For instance, soft contact lenses in a normal cornea, it would fit just fine. But the patient on the right, for instance, has keratoconus, the cornea is a different shape. The soft contact lens might not fit as well. In addition, it doesn't have that rigid front surface that would help to resurface the shape of the eye so that the, the, the patient's still gonna get a lot of aberrations. Patients with keratoconus will complain about glare at night, blurred vision at all distances, et cetera. But they do make other more specialized soft contact lenses for patients with keratoconus. And you'll be surprised, and I'm always constantly surprised how well vision can be with these soft lenses, which aren't truly soft as in terms of the run of the mill kind, but they're not hard like the rigid gas permeable lenses. Two examples here, for instance, are Novacone and Kerasoft. These are designed by companies like Alden and Bosch and Loam to be essentially a soft kind of lens, but just a thicker modulus, basically a thicker lens design to help to mask some of the irregularities. And so patients who can't handle the comfort of a, of a hard contact kind of lens, they do very well with these. And the parameters are quite Quite, quite ranging. So you can get sphere powers from plus 30 to minus 30, cell powers up to minus 10. On top of the fact that the, the thickness of the soft kind of lens is um, you know, much higher modulus and thicker than a rather well, middle kind. So it does help to mask some of those aberrations and irregularities as well. So it's kind of like halfway towards a, to a hard contact lens. So it's a good, a good starting point for some patients who can't handle those. In, in general, you have these three types. We have the soft kind lenses that we just talked about. The middle is the rigid gas permeable lenses, which, we're, which we've been doing for many, many decades. And something that's coming on more recently and more popular over just the last 10 years are scleral contact lenses. These are the larger gas permeable lenses. And in fact, the majority of patients with keratoconus benefit from those these days. But going back to the what we used to do more often and still is done when patients can handle the other types is just the regular RGPs or rigid gas permeable lenses. Usually these are really high in oxygen. Um, they're usually less than nine millimeters wide. And so if you think of the corner as 11 millimeters or so, and then this is a couple of millimeters smaller. So it fits just over the corner. It doesn't extend beyond it. You want a really thin lens 
And ideally, you want the lens not to be too flat so it doesn't uh, rub up on the corner whatsoever. So you want, uh, we call it apical clearance. When it doesn't touch the corner in the middle, it clears the, the apex of the corner. We call it apical clearance. So an example of, um, uh, of a bad fit is, uh, it would be a lens that fits too flat here, which happens very often with patients with keratoconus versus, uh, you know, on a normal corner, it might fit a little bit better like this. Um, but if you design the lens correctly, though, if it's custom made for a patient with keratoconus, which we can do with our software programs at our office, then it could fit like a glove and patients find that it is actually very comfortable. An example would be like this. We take a topography of a patient's eye. Think of a, this topography like, um, think of the, the blue like water and then the greens and reds like the island coming out of the water. So like an island. So the red spots are like the top of the island and they're very steep. And then the water is sea level there. And so if this is the map, we would design a lens on the right that matches the curvature and K values, um, essentially the shape of the eye matches it one-to-one. -one, so the lens should fit like this, like a glove on the bottom with our software programs. Some patients that can't handle uh, rigid gas permeable lenses, you might've heard of piggybacking. Piggybacking is where you have a soft contact lens first because uh, it's more comfortable than the rigid, rigid ones. And then they wear a rigid one on top of this. I'd say less than 5% of my patients are in a piggybacking system, but I uh, just had a patient today. He's a, um, um, a periodontist uh, around in Orange County, very successful one. And he he's tried everything, scleros, he's tried uh, soft um, lenses, uh, custom-made ones and rigid gas permeable lenses. And the only thing that works out for him are these piggyback ones. Uh, there are there are other ways as well that you can also combine though the soft contact lens and a hard contact lens center. So the beauty of this is that the center, which is uh, the made from the rigid gas permeable material, is a little bit stiffer, and so it helps to resurface the front part of the eye, help to mask a lot of the aberrations. But the lens is not as uncomfortable because at the edge of the lens, it's soft. So when the patient blinks, the eye glides over the soft skirt, and it's much more comfortable. Which is, I would say, the number one. Uh, problem with the rigid gas permeable lens, which was comfort issues in the past. These are just examples of what we would look at. We would basically have a patient wear this lens. We'd apply a dye to it. And then if the dye seeps underneath it, it tells us how the lens is fitting. So when you go to your optometrist or your ophthalmologist, you always notice they might put this green, this green color or, you know, kind of orange color on your eye. And then they shine a blue light on your eye. It's for them to check how things are looking in your cornea or how things are looking in terms of how the lens might sit on your eye. Examples where it's black here is where the lens is touching the eye and bearing versus here if it's um, all green, the lens is vaulting and not touching the corner of that spot. It's a little bit, in this situation, it's too high. This one is kind of optimal, kind of even throughout. The most popular lens today though, what is done probably about 85% of the time or more for patients with keratoconus or post laser uh, complications, uh, post RK, even patients that I've seen with corneal dystrophies, uh, usually a lot of them have been doing really well with scleral lenses. So we call it a scleral lens because the white part of the eye is called a sclera and the lens only touches essentially the white part of the eye. So it doesn't touch the middle part whatsoever. It only touches the white part of the eye. And so we call it a, a scleral lens for that reason. It's usually 14 to 20 millimeters in diameter, which is much larger than the cornea. So the way it is, the way it is uh, made is essentially like this. It lands here where these little black arrows are. That's where it touches the eye. There's a lot of advantages to that because there are a lot less nerve endings there. Um, and also the fact that it vaults the middle, there's no chance for it to rub up or scar the cornea or whatsoever. Um, you fill the inside with this liquid reservoir and you can fill it with just um, sterile saline. And what's nice is that it makes the vision really good because now the eye is essentially the shape of the scleral lens instead of the shape of the coin underneath. In this situation, this patient has keratoconus. And uh, not only can it help patients with keratoconus see better, but I've had patients who actually just have normal uh, shaped corners, but they have severe dry eyes. I had a patient today with uh, Sjogren's syndrome, which can lead to severe dryness of the eyes. We put this little, we put the scleral lens on and then we fill the liquid reservoir with saline and sometimes even just preserve free artificial tears and refresh cellular risk and things like that. And the patient has a liquid bandage on all day long and it helps them to heal their cornea. Same thing with patients, for instance, I had a patient yesterday he came in, his eyelids don't close all the way. Um, and so since his eyelids don't close all the way, 
his eyes get really dry. And so we're doing this for him as well. So now um, his cornea is completely protected. Uh, even if he can't blink anymore whatsoever, it's at least the cornea and anything underneath the lens, which we can make, you know, 16, 18, 20 millimeters in size, everything underneath it is essentially bathed in that solution. And it, um, it helps to reduce any uh, dryness of the cornea. So he had a lot of inflammation, but I checked him the other day. Um, I've checked other patients after doing this for a week or two, and now I see the corner where before it had a lot of inflammation. We call it SPK. It's essentially gone after a few weeks, which is really nice. This has nothing to do with anything, but this is my daughter, Kinsey. She's uh, 10 months old now, and uh, I dressed her up as a koala bear on Halloween. Just thought you guys should know that. Um, <laughs> some benefits for scleral lenses is that they're just very comfortable. There are less nerve endings on the conjunctiva and the sclera, the white part of the eye, than there is on the cornea. So the lenses are just more comfortable because of that. But you still get that nice crisp vision with the hard material because it, it's more rigid. It doesn't flex. And so patients that have irregularities of the cornea, it essentially smooths everything over and also could act like a liquid bandage for patients who have very dry eyes. Patients that have keratoconus and corneal transplants, those are the majority of the patients I see, uh, as well as post-surgical um, patients that have RK surgery, um, just uh, uh, too many cuts on the cornea that led to uh, some damage. Uh, we see that all the time. Um, other patients, patients that have severe dry eyes, like I mentioned, that patient with Sjogren's, uh, patients who can't blink properly, Graffer's host disease, Stephen Johnson's, these are patients who have just a lot of inflammation of the cornea. And they do really well with these contact lenses because they act like liquid bandages. So again, the, the scleral lens, in order for it to fit properly, it should clear the cornea. It should clear, we call it the limbus, which is the edge of the cornea where the cornea hits and meets the white part of the eye. And it should bear evenly throughout the whole thing. Um, 360 degrees on the white part of the eye. It shouldn't bear too much on the top or bottom or side to side. It should ideally be even throughout the whole thing. An example of that would be like this. The center part should vault the central cornea. So again, the lens should not touch the cornea whatsoever. It should vault 100 to 300 microns over it. We'll take OCT measurements at our office where we can actually scan how the lens is sitting on the eye and actually measure that vault. If the vault is too high, like 600, 800 microns, then the patient has had a lens design, <clears throat> excuse me, which probably is too high. And then if the lens is too high, they'll, they'll complain about foggy vision. So I get a lot of patients at our office who have, who have scleral lenses from other offices, but they complain that the lenses fog up on them, they get dry, and we troubleshoot that at our office quite often by using our new technologies. Here's an example where the lens is a little bit too tight. You can see here the lens is landing really there. It's kind of like um, if you wear a watch on your arm, and you move the watch after wearing it all day long, you, it gets a little, you see a little like impression mark. That's what's happening here. And so when it happens there, you'll, leave, you'll see this is white band and then a lot of redness. And the patient will take the lens out and the eye is extremely red. So you'd rather, you'd rather have that nice even landing. On the other end of the spectrum, you see here on the bottom right that sometimes the lens will actually peek out and you'll see a little bit of, we call it edge lift. When the patient is blinking, their eyelid will hit that edge of the lens and they'll say it's very uncomfortable. And so the lens shouldn't be too tight like the other one and it shouldn't be too flat or too loose like this one. Otherwise, it would be uncomfortable both ways. This is an example of another lens that's a little bit too loose. I am shining a light on it. And you can see a little shadow right here because the lens is um, lifted off the eye a little bit too much, leaving a shadow. Most patients, uh, have lens, most patients have scleros that are, we call it torque in nature. What that means is that it's shaped more like a football than a basketball. So not just the cornea can have, you know, astigmatism, but you can also have scleral astigmatism in a way or scleral toricity. When that happens, we should design a contact lens that matches that to, to, to make for the fact that the, the sclera is not also perfectly round either. There are other things you can do to reduce fogging as well. We add a special coating to the lens called tangible hydropeg. So most contact lenses are traditionally are hydrophobic in nature in terms of the material. So that, so water and tears will bead up like in this situation on the left. If by adding on the same patient, just a lens that has something called hydropeg, it adds a hydrophilic layer on the top surface of the lens. So the lens wets much better, much more comfortable. Here's an example of a patient, uh, not a patient, of a lens with um, out hydropeg. It, uh, lots of things in this situation, all the uh, liquid will just stick to it. With this one, it comes in and out and doesn't stick whatsoever. 
patient. Uh, patients can fill the lens with different things. A lot of patients use saline, but a lot of my patients with keratoconus have said this is a game changer for them. There's a new something new out just recently called Neutrophil. It actually has a lot of electrolytes and nutrients in it to help them be a little bit better pH balanced and have a little bit better comfort. So some patients that don't do well with just saline, we sometimes try Neutrophil as well, and that can get rid of some of that fogging issue. Some newer technologies out today are traditionally, we would just fit lenses via guess and check. The doctor would put the lens on, we check it with a microscope and say, oh, well, it needs to be a little bit looser, a little bit steeper here, et cetera. Nowadays, things are done much more precisely. We can actually map out not just the shape of the cornea, but even the shape of the sclera as well. So at our office, on every patient, no matter what, all of them get a scleral map. So we can design and, and look at the topography, not just of the cornea, the center part, but even the shape of the sclera. And so for that, we take that data and we design the lens based on it. I'll give you an example. This patient has a glaucoma. They have a little shunt right here. You can see a little tube coming in on the side of the sclera. And you can kind of see on the elevation map, this is uh, the topography where you can see that red elevation and uh, kind of extending towards the cornea there. I send the data to the lab and we can design together a lens that tries to either be truncated and avoid the area altogether or to vault the whole, whole thing because we know the exact shape of it. We could be within 10 microns of accuracy throughout the entire sclera. So chances, it's very low that we design a lens that's too loose or too tight because we can do it with this map to design our very first lens. After we design a lens, we use instruments called OCT, for instance. This is an example of a patient who came in, they had a scleral lens for another office, but they were complaining that the lens was giving them a lot of fogging issues. So I had them come to the office and I did an OCT. Think of an OCT like doing a super special scan of your eye. In this, in this particular scan, it's at the front part of the eye. So you can see on top here, it's hard to see, but this, these two little lines here are the scleral lens. This middle part here where it says 734 is how much the scleral lens is vaulting over the patient's cornea and the cornea is on the bottom. So you, you remember me telling you that ideally we want to only be 100 to 300 microns of clearance. This situation has a patient where the lens um, was clearing 734. So it's more than twice as much. When that happens, the patient will have a lot of fogging issues. They're complaining about blurred vision. Sometimes the cornea doesn't get as much oxygen as it needs and it starts to swell up. So this patient I had, I'm going to design with a lens that's much more closer to the cornea. It's gonna resolve a lot of her issues from her skull lenses that she had from her other office. So this is an, here's another example on the left. This is the traditional skull lenses that we would fit, you know, five, 10 years ago. This is how we would do like um, uh, you know, pros lenses and things like that, um, which we still do as well, but uh, uh, it takes a little bit more work where sometimes you have areas where it's perfect and some areas here where the vault is too much. Nowadays, we design lenses based on, we, we basically cheat. We just scan the eye. We know the shape of it throughout the whole thing, center to the periphery. And uh, we design a lens that just matches it uh, with an even, even clearance throughout the whole thing. So it's less cause for problems there. And when that happens, the patients will say, hey, it feels like butter <laughs> compared to my last one. In, in closing, I want to just mention a few things. Know that wearing contact lenses, though, uh, and I've heard this from patients, and I want to dispel this myth, wearing contact lenses does not stop your eyes from getting any worse. Wearing contact lenses helps you see better, helps to definitely can treat dryness of the eyes, um, but mainly it's, it's the vision correction that it helps the most with. Um, and a patient come, can come into the office, for instance, this is the same patient. The, person, the, the picture on the left is when they've been wearing a rigid gas permeable lens. This is the same patient on their right. They just weren't wearing their lenses for a few days and their eyes changed shape back to the original shape. So um, in this picture on the left, maybe you might say, oh, the K values are flatter, it's better. But really it's just because the cornea kind of flattens out temporarily, but doesn't last uh, long. If you really want to stop the eyes from getting worse, one thing that we do at office all the time is we refer out to our younger, especially to our younger patients for a condition for a procedure called corner cross linking. And so I, all, I regularly um, talk to them about all the doctors at the Gavin Eye Institute. And uh, you'll notice the one on the left is uh, Dr. Marjan Freed, and she's going to be chatting with you guys next. But uh, yeah, our, our patients absolutely love the care that they receive at the Gavin Eye Institute. And, uh, and I just want to say thank you all for listening. Hope you guys learned something and uh, feel free to take any questions. This is my other child. Uh, that's Jackson. He's pretending to talk on a cell phone. And because uh, grandma gave him this 
plastic cell phone so he can act like a grown up. And that ends my lecture. That was awesome, Dr. Mai. Thank you so much. I just want to remind everyone because I didn't see any questions coming through the chat. Um, please go ahead and, and submit your questions or if you're so inclined and want to turn on your camera and uh, throw a question out live, um, I guess we can do that as well right now. But I wanted to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Mai for um, taking care of all of these patients. I'll tell you, when I started um, doing corneal surgery 14 years ago, um, I was transplanting keratoconus patients a lot more frequently and happily, I don't have to do it as much. And it's a lot because of the scleral lens technologies that we have because they're so uh, comfortable for patients who have traditionally would have failed previous contact lens therapies and specifically Dr. Mai and his team are amazing. So I, I tell my patients, if Dr. Mai and his team can fit you, they're the only ones that can. If they can't fit you, no one else is going to be able to. Then, then you're going to need surgery. But um, you know, often many times the, the 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 need for surgery gets delayed and delayed and delayed, which is good um, because you can just uh, get such excellent results with the scleral lens therapy. So thank you, Dr. Mai. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity to join you. Um, all right, so I, I don't see any questions. Um, again, please feel free to use that chat feature, um, but we will also take questions at the end, both of us. So um, you can also uh, save your questions for then. Maybe I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen then. Um, All right, so this is a new computer, so all right, I think it should let me share now. There we are. Okay, I think we're on. So um, all right, so I'll jump right in. Um, again, so uh, with keratoconus specifically, you know, uh, we try to um, screen patients earlier. Now, screening tools have become um, more and more advanced in terms of topography. Um, there is a genetic test coming out um, where we can do a cheek swab um, in patients who are, we're suspicious for keratoconus, but may not have clinically evident keratoconus yet. Um, and that uh, cheek swab or genetic test, almost like um, I think it's 99 in me or 95 in me, where 23 in me, sorry, where you kind of do a genetic test to look for, um, uh, you know, genetic background. This, this does a genetic test for your risk um, for developing keratoconus. So if there's a family history or even in the absence of a family history, we're now able to genetically test patients who may be a little suspicious and be able to. Uh, get a risk score on their um, likelihood of developing keratoconus. Um, our topographies are getting better. We're able to genetically screen patients. And so the need again for more advanced therapies is declining. Um, but I will jump into what we do nowadays to sort of help with prevention of worsening of, cross, of uh, keratoconus when we do diagnose it. So um, corneal cross-linking, many, many of you may have heard. Uh, this was first studied in Europe and the University of Dresden in the late 1990s. And essentially, um, we found that doing a procedure which uses ultraviolet light and riboflavin, which is a vitamin B drop um, into the cornea, that combination, um, the absorption of the UVA by the riboflavin within the cornea generates these what we call radical riboflavin and oxygen to form crosslinks or to basically stiffen the collagen fibers within the cornea. And that stiffening results in stabilization of the cornea because um, keratoconus is basically a softening of the, uh, or, or uh, not enough stiffness genetically to the corneal collagen or the substance of the cornea. This uh, procedure then can stiffen the cornea. 
Um, this was first presented in 1998 um, at a medical uh, meeting and has become now accepted modality worldwide for the treatment of corneal ectasias and keratoconus. So who are candidates for corneal cross-linking? Um, basically patients who have keratoconus who have been diagnosed with keratoconus, um, post-LASIK ectasia, progressive disease. So keratoconus that is actively worsening, these are the best candidates for corneal cross-linking. Um, we do want to have patients who have acceptable vision with either one of these contact lenses or with glasses. If it's gotten to the point that neither a contact lens nor glasses uh, any longer support vision, sometimes at that point you need to go to corneal transplantation, which I will talk about as well. Um, but there's a little bit of a, a process with this procedure. So cooperation and participation in treatment and post-operative regimen is also necessary. So how do we define progression? Well, it's defined as a change in at least two of the following parameters. Um, so either worsening steepness of the cornea, so the cor cornea is becoming more conical in shape, if you will. Um, either the front of the cornea or the backside of the cornea is, is changing shape progressively. Um, if there's thinning that's occurring, the corneal um, uh, thickness itself is starting to decline. And change in vision, or if the vision continues to get worse. So I have a lot of patients that say, you know, over the past few months, they go in and their astigmatism values and their refraction continues to progressively change. That really raises our suspicion that there's progressive disease. <clears throat> and of course, keratoconus is a disease that progresses mostly in the teens and 20s um, and 30s to some extent. So in that age range where our, um, uh, our suspicion is higher and our uh, threshold for moving into cross-linking is lower. So we really want to uh, stabilize patients who are in that age range. So ideal candidates um, over the age of 14, but actually that number is, um, you know, getting younger as well. We are able to uh, treat um, uh, kids who are um, older than 10. Um, healthy, uh, progressive keratoconus patients, they're able to lay still for about an hour. Excuse me. Um, if there's adequate corneal thickness. So in order to be able to do corneal uh, collagen cross-linking, there has to be a minimum thickness to the cornea that's acceptable. That's around 400 microns uh, of thickness. A clear visual access. So if there's a big scar on the cornea, they're not the best candidate. And again, good vision in contact lenses or glasses. So this patient who has, has had keratoconus and has pretty severe keratoconus, you can see there's a white uh, scar or haze there in, in the part of the cornea. And if you look from the side, there's significant thinning of that cornea. This is not an ideal candidate for cross-linking. So again, very steep corneas, poor vision with contact lenses, very thin corneas, or patients who are over the, I have many patients who come to me in their forties or fifties who have keratoconus and wonder if they may be a candidate for cross-linking. If they're stable, if the patient is very stable um, and their topography has not been shifting, then we don't necessarily need to do this procedure because with age and just being out in the sunlight um, by the age of 40 or 50, the risk of progression is less. We've naturally been cross-linked um, you know, over the years. So patients who are older and are stable don't necessarily need cross-linking. We, all, all, uh, we follow those patients and look for progression, but in the absence of that, we don't need to do cross-linking. So this is a case of a 16 year old um, young man who presented to us with worsening keratoconus vision. Um, and over uh, two years ago, his vision was 20-20 in both eyes, but now it's dropping and there is a big change in the prescription. So when we looked at him in 2016, his maximum corneal steepness was this number 60.5. And then two years later, he's 66.1. So that is a clear steepening or worsening of the keratoconus. Um, the cornea is becoming more conical in shape. And so this is a patient who needs cross-linking. So what do I tell patients? Well, the main thing is cross-linking is not refractive surgery. This is not LASIK. So the goal is not you're not necessarily going to regain 20-20 vision. The goal is to stop 
the keratoconus from progressing from the vision to get uh, getting worse and worse and and uh, to maintain the patient in uh, whatever they're using for vision, whether it's contact lenses or glasses. Um, there is a post-operative healing process where there's a little bit of worsening before it gets better right after cross-linking. So I want to make sure patients understand that the, their vision isn't going to come back uh, too quickly. There's a post-operative period, and then there's a little bit of haze that develops for a few months um, and then gets better after that. Um, there is a, a little steepening before the cornea gets flat over a year, and I'll show you a, a curve on that. Um, in one to two percent of patients, um, they you can have complications such as a cornea that doesn't heal after the procedure, edema, scarring, um, even infection is a risk in this procedure. But it's a small risk, um, and glasses and contact lenses will still be needed. So the procedure is uh, basically we it's done in the office. We uh, remove the epithelium uh, off of the surface of the cornea. It's, the, the patient's eye is numb during the procedure, so it is a painless procedure. Um, we add drops to the eye every two minutes. This is that vitamin riboflavin drop for about 30 minutes. And then we do 30 minutes of the UV light, as well as the drops that continue every um, two minutes. I put a soft contact lens on the eye. It acts like a Band-Aid. We start um, the patient on antibiotic drops and lots of artificial tears. That first night, once the numbing medicine wears off, I always tell patients there is pretty significant pain for one night, but that, that epithelium or the surface cells start to heal uh, fairly quickly and heal within about 24 hours. Um, so this is what it looks like. Oh, this is not my graph. Uh, what are other things I counsel patients? I tell them, don't rub your eyes. You shouldn't rub your eyes anyways if you have keratoconus because that can worsen the steepening. Um, there is light sensitivity, foreign body sensation, um, irritation for a few days. Um, and, you know, I tell patients if there's, a, after that 24 hours, if there's still severe pain, they really do need to come back in and get their eye checked. Um, if the contact lens falls out of the eye, it, you know, cause I leave it in there for a few days. I, I tell patients either come in or don't try to put it back into the eye, but leave it off and just lubricate a lot. So does cross-linking work? Does it need to be repeated? Well, the studies uh, did show significant, um, improvement, uh, or prevention of progression, um, over the course of that year, when, when uh, they looked, about 3% of patients did continue to progress. So I tell patients this is about 97% effective, um, about 3% of the time, because we continue to follow topography even afterwards. If there's continued progression, we may need to repeat the procedure. Um, and I'll talk about, well, what is the best method? What is uh, the most common method that we use? That's the one I, I talked about. This is what the K-Max looks like. So you can see in the first month, there's actually a little bit of a worsening of the K-Max. Everything looks a little steeper before it starts to flatten about three months and then continues to flatten um, to about a year. And sometimes we even see flattening continuing even between year one and year three. The FDA approved protocol is what we call epithelium off. That's that procedure where we uh, remove the surface cells of the eye before the procedure. And then it's a 30 minute soak with the drops and the 30 minutes of light. So it's a one hour procedure. All right. Um, what are the complications? So you can get haze about most people uh, 50 to 90% of patients um, get haze, but it does resolve by about year one. Um, sometimes an infection can occur because this is an open wound when we remove the epithelium. Again, it's very rare, but it's not zero. So patients are started on antibiotic uh, drops and we watch uh, carefully. Uh, but otherwise there's no other adverse effects on the inner layers of the cornea. So what's coming? Uh, you know, this is a great procedure for patients who are 14 and older. For younger kids, it can be difficult because it's hard for a younger child to lay flat for an hour to go through the procedure. And of course, it is painful for a night. 
Um, a lot of early studies uh, were done looking at epithelium on, so where you don't scrape the epithelium, so there's really no post-operative pain and so on. Um, and various accelerated protocols have also been studied. But despite all of that, the um, those show to be inferior to what we do, which is standard epithelium off. However, the cool thing is there are newer formulations of the riboflavin um, that can potentially help improve the penetration into the cornea so that we don't need to remove that epithelium. So these are still being studied. And I'm very hopeful that the future of cross-linking will be epithelium on, which will be a lot uh, easier, there won't be a risk of infection, there won't be haze formation, and it won't be painful. So uh, we're looking forward to that, those studies um, and the development of that protocol. There's also a chemical cross-linking that's being studied where um, just with a special drop without the need for a light or a procedure that we can create stiffening with it within the cornea. Again, very early phases. So we're looking at about probably five to seven years before we see some of these developments, but very, very exciting things um, in the pipeline. What about intacts? You guys may have heard about intacts. These are little intracorneal ring segments that were actually initially approved for patients who didn't want to be so nearsighted. So you kind of um, uh, surgically put these into the corneal stroma. Um, they do tend to flatten the cornea so they can create a little bit more symmetry. Um, and several studies have looked at these. Um, I'll tell you that the, there isn't a whole lot of wide acceptance. There are some uh, keratoconus doctors who are still employing the use of intacts in some patients, um, but um, oftentimes uh, the progression tends to continue. Now, intacts with cross-linking can change that a little bit. So in corneas where we are able to change the shape successfully with intacts, which is a small percentage, using cross-linking with that may be helpful. Cross-linking either at the same time or three months later, these have shown to be about equal in terms of the studies. I won't go into the detail of that. Um, and this is uh, a topography that shows flattening with the intacts. I won't go into that too much either. Um, but it's a very exciting time because corneal cross-linking is now standard of care for progressive keratoconus. And the goal is to stabilize and maintain vision. The current protocol is the one hour epithelial off procedure, um, which shows a 97% success rate, very good. And patients do very, very well with this. But again, looking at epi on techniques, chemical cross-linking, combining uh, cross-linking with either PRK or intacts, all of these are uh, studies are on, underway and we expect good things um, in the future. Now, just, I'm going to briefly go over corneal transplantation as well for keratoconus. So this is for the most severe of the severe patients who have such severe ectasia of their corneas, such significant thinning that contact lenses are no longer helpful and they're beyond the point of getting cross-linking. Um, so femtosecond laser technology is really what I want to talk about a little bit here. Um, in this day and age, one of the advances is we don't necessarily transplant the entire cornea, but we can do disease targeted corneal surgery. And um, so what the femtosecond laser does is it helps us, if you think of this blue area as the cornea, instead of using a cookie cutter and cutting the cornea, straight down, the femtosecond laser allows really precise cuts at specified, exact specified depths within the cornea. So when we do the corneal transplant, um, instead of having sort of a butt joint, and if you know anything about carpentry, you know a butt joint is the least stable type of a joint. But instead of doing that, we're able to do something like a zigzag pattern, where both the donor cornea, which we get from someone who's recently passed, as well as the recipient cornea are both cut with the same zigzag pattern with a femtosecond laser. And this allows the donor cornea that goes onto this uh, for the transplant to have sort of this interlocking, almost like a lock and key fit together. So there's less torsional and less vertical misalignment. So uh, there's less astigmatism. And you can see here the zigzag pattern. This is an OCT like the ones Dr. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Mai showed you where you can see the pattern of scarring in that zigzag formation in the cornea, uh, within the cornea. So 
with a femtosecond laser technology, we're able to get better wound integrity. There's more surface area for wound healing and better uh, mechanical stability of the incisions. Um, so our sutures don't need to be as tight. They can be removed earlier. The visual recovery is faster. And, and uh, this is what the patient looks like under the femtosecond laser. That takes about 45 seconds to about a minute to do the cut on, on the cornea. It's a painless procedure there. Um, and once we've, I hope nobody's, you can just close your eyes if you don't like to watch uh, videos, but um, this is a video of a transplant transplant using that zigzag cut that's been made. And then we're able to finish the zigzag cut within the, uh, with a corneal scissor. And then uh, we suture the donor cornea onto the host. And you can see that um, happening here. The zigzag also really allows really good alignment of those sutures. Um, so it makes the suturing and the surgery much, much easier as well. Here's what it looks like afterwards at the slit lamp. You can see that nice cornea, there's the suture. And when you look um, close up, you can actually make out the three layers of the zigzag pattern there. So we've done a lot of studies on this um, and I'm sorry, this slide is busy. I'll just translate it. Uh, we saw that patients with the zigzag versus traditional corneal transplants recovered vision and, uh, much faster and their astigmatism was lower than patients who had had traditional corneal transplants. And that's sustained. So we, we're looking at these patients now uh, seven and a half years, almost about 10 years out, and we're getting those sustained good outcomes, uh, both in vision as well as astigmatism, as well as corneal irregularity. So these are corneas are much more regular. Um, these patients are more likely to be able to wear uh, glasses um, and, and uh, not necessarily have to go back into a contact lens if they don't want to. Um, we have combined this technique with something called deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, where you replace everything uh, in the cornea except that last layer, which is actually healthy in patients with keratoconus. This red layer is the endothelial layer. Um, and if we can keep that in place, then the risk of rejection um, goes down. And so we're able to use an air bubble um, to separate that tissue. Uh, put the new donor on. Again, it's a zigzag pattern to a zigzag pattern, and the patient maintains their own endothelial layer, which decreases their risk of rejection. Um, I'll skip the video in, in, in the interest of time, and this is what the post-operative appearance is. So some of the post-transplant educational points are, um, you know, sutures we usually um, are able to remove over the course of a year. I usually take out a few um, every visit starting out after about month three or month four. Um, there is a risk of rejection with transplantation, but um, you know, it's low in patients who have keratoconus. It's on the order of three to 5%. So we follow those patients carefully. Uh, patients do take steroid eye drops, which is an anti-rejection eye drop um, for, for many years often um, in, in a tapering fashion. Um, cataract sometimes does develop earlier in patients who have corneal transplant, both because of the steroids as well as the surgery itself, but cataracts is something we can actually manage fairly um, easily. And ultimately, patients do still need um, correction for glasses or contact lenses. I, I have done LASIK on top of corneal transplants um, to sort of correct any residual refractive error in some patients. So um, we do have a lot of patients who are out of glasses and contact lenses all together. So we now have technology to specifically address the part of the cornea, which is disease and the femtosecond laser, which is sort of my baby. We really helped develop that here at the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. It's really given surgeons and new tools for achieving better and faster visual recovery after transplant. And with that, um, I hope I didn't bore everyone to sleep. Uh, we'll open it up to, for questions. And I think Great. I, I'm, yeah, I we can bring you. back Dr. Mai as well. I, I see a question here for you, Dr. Fareed, from one of the okay. uh, people in the audience. I'll read it to you. Yeah. Uh, but, by the way, I, I always learn something watching uh, and, and listening to you every single time, no matter what. And uh, I learn something from you too, every time. For those, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Fareed has the 
the prettiest sutures. So when I see the cases afterwards, they're all nice and even, and it's it's all the coin is all perfect. It's great. Okay, so question from uh, the audience is uh, regarding the genetic testing you mentioned in the beginning. Uh, what is a good age to do that test, and is there a minimum age? Yeah, no, it, you actually any age can do the test. Um, you know, if if you know you have keratoconus based on topography, then there's really no reason to take the test. But if you have kids who have, you know, kids or, um, and you want to know if they are at higher risk, um, that's a good question. I don't think they've done it in infants. It's a cheek swab, so it's not very invasive. It's just a genetic test. So potentially it could be done at any age. It's very straightforward and simple. And um, so it's for patients who maybe family members of patients who have keratoconus um, who are younger, you might want to see if you can catch it earlier. Um, I also, um, I'm going to start doing it on patients who want LASIK because sometimes patients come in who want LASIK and, and if we, we, um, their topography looks a little suspicious, um, I want to genetic test them, make sure they, they don't have a predilection for keratoconus before we do that. It's a good idea. I like that for LASIK because yeah. some of the patients that we've seen afterwards are those post-LASIK ectasias. Yeah. I see another question. Um, so you have a five-year-old and a little one on the way. So the other thing is keratoconus in, in a five-year-old, it's not going to really develop. I'd say in, in the little ones, you know, just try to avoid eye rubbing. Um, even if we know their risk score is high, we just sort of watch them until they're, you know, 10 and older anyways, because we don't usually see clinical signs uh, before that age. I don't know. How, how early have you started contact lens fitting, Dr. Mai? For, um, for patients with keratoconus or just in general? Keratoconus. Keratoconus, um, let's see, our youngest one was probably 10, 11 so far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, usually we don't, uh, it's possible that people will get it earlier. We just, they don't come to the office until later, until it's, right. it's yeah, they try glasses first. And so, yeah, usually that, that was the youngest we've seen. Yeah. But we do want to catch them right around age 10 and above so that mm -hmm. that's sort of the age when we can start thinking about um, cross-linking patients who are starting to have some clinical signs because the sooner you can freeze that process, the better. I'm, I'm really looking for, I was just at the Academy of Ophthalmology. I heard about these drops that they're studying that's just going to chemically cross-link these corneas. And mm -hmm. I'm very excited about that because um, then there's no procedure at all, hopefully that will be available at some point. I, I've heard of that too. I'm excited. And um, I'm curious about the Epion studies that are happening. I, I have a tradition I've been telling patients, I've had patients who talk about going to like Beverly Hills and getting Epion. I still have been telling them Epion and to, to go see you, Dr. Free, for Epion. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's a good thought too. So there are some doctors who are doing Epion off-label. So it's an off-label. Yeah. The only FDA-approved procedure is the epithelium off-procedure, which is what we do. Um, I'd say if you get an Epion, make sure to still follow very closely because more Epion eyes will continue to progress than epi off. So the risk of progression is higher. Uh, so you may need to have it done again, or then have an epi off if, if you show that you're still progressing. So it's just not as effective. Exactly. That's, a, that's exactly what I say as well. Yeah. Uh, we'll ask you a question. How risky is LASIK procedure for corrective vision? What percent failure? Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming this is LASIK. So if for keratoconus, LASIK is completely contraindicated. So if you have keratoconus, uh, we would not do uh, LASIK on, on your eyes. Um, for, for regular people who don't have keratoconus, normal cornea is healthy. And we always screen uh, patients who come in for LASIK to make sure their topographies look normal. Um, then, then there's a very successful procedure. If you're in the right age group, there's a lot of factors we look at, uh, and, and your prescription is within a range that's, uh, um, okay for LASIK. So, uh, you know, I've had LASIK, um, so it's, it is a very successful procedure if you are a good candidate. Good question. Simi, I asked uh, you a question. I've read some research papers discussing the use of femtolytic lasers being used for corner cross-linking. Do you know if there's a benefit to using a femtosecond laser as opposed to UV? Hmm. Um, okay. I know. <laughs> and in fact, I know exactly what, what um, um, Ms. Sima is talking about because this is, um, 
very early uh, studies that actually Dr. Jamie Jester, he is a PhD scientist in our department who is specifically looking at using the femtosecond beam. So the femtosecond laser beam in very low energy does not cut tissue. I talked about femtosecond lasers with the higher energy. In that case, it actually behaves like a knife, like a very specific knife for corneal transplants. In low, low energy, a femtosecond laser, it, it almost acts like light. And you can do very specific cross-linking within a portion of the cornea. This is totally in research phase right now. So it is potentially very cool because you can uh, then cross link parts of the cornea more than the others. Right now, our UV light is nine millimeters and it cross links that entire nine millimeters the same. But um, this is great. I'm glad you're reading these papers. That's uh, uh, you know very uh, much in the um, basic science uh, uh, phase right now, but may reach clinical significance later on. That's great. Very cool stuff. Yes, I agree. <laughs> awesome. All right. So I have a question for Dr. Mai. Um, you know, what's really cool um, outside of keratoconus with these scleral lenses is the ability to treat patients with severe dry eyes. Yes because that's something else I treat that's such a challenge. So, you know, how do you um, decide when to start putting a patient in a scleral lens for dry eyes? What are the criteria you're looking for? Yeah, I, I check to make sure, um, is there, are there lids under control? Sometimes they have blepharitis issues, my boy and gland dysfunction, a lot of those things have to be addressed first. I usually don't do scleral lenses or recommend unless they've done those other things first. Because mm -hmm. I think sometimes there's actually issues with scleral lenses as well. The front surface of the lens, the cornea itself will be moisturized the entire time. That is factually true unless there's an air bubble in, in there. But the front surface still can be dry and patients, when they're blinking, if they're blinking over a dry contact lens, they'll still feel dry, even though the cornea is not dry. Oh. So they're still complaining about dryness. So I, I counsel them that they have to make sure that essentially all the stuff they used to do originally, they still continue with it actually. So this is a supplement to it, not a replacement for those things. As long as they're aware about that and they're usually, and they've gone through and done those other things first, taking care of their, you know, taking omega-3 vitamins, either drinking enough water, maybe they're on zydrostasis and things like that. Uh, then I talk about skull lenses after those things. But, for, but again, for those patients who have severe from Sjogren's disease, again, that patient who I mentioned can't blink anymore because they had um, lid surgeries. Uh, it is essentially um, life-changing for them because they, they were not even functioning before and now they can function. So um, for those patients, it's exciting. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it be life-changing for some of those patients. Um, patients who have limbal stem cell deficiency, yep. a severe ocular surface disease where there's really no hope that the contact lenses, the, the, these have really changed patients' lives. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, great. All right. Wonderful. A anybody, uh, any other questions? Um, we still have a few minutes. If anybody has anything, we really appreciate everybody joining on, um, anything else about keratoconus in general, um, dry eyes. I think one of the pearls, you know, I tell all my keratoconus patients, I'm sure Dr. Mai does as well as don't rub your eyes. Yeah. Um, cause even after cross-linking the, the risk of progression with eye rubbing is way higher. So, um, you know, use allergy drops when you need to treat things like blepharitis and dry eyes so that, uh, the, the better your eyes feel, the less likely you are to rub them. Exactly. And uh, I, uh, a counselor with uh, you know uh, genetic history or young children to get regular eye checks at least once a year just to screen for these things especially if there's family history of it uh, an ounce of uh, um, prevention is worth a pound of cure so getting cross-linking when you're you know 13 14 15 years old and you've been dying of keratoconus is literally, literally life-changing for the 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 lifetime uh, you know value of like the vision you know, for these patients and so the earlier you catch it the better absolutely Great. All right. Dana, uh, uh, we'll turn it back to you. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any closing housekeeping things you need to announce. 
I'm here. Thank you. So um, thank you all for joining us. Um, I, they talked about having uh, your eyes checked. And in case you don't know, the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute does have an optical shop um, in, uh, in the building on, on campus. And also any of our um, ophthalmologists can also do an exam. But we do have um, an optical shop, even if you just need your annual eye exam. So do think of us for that as well. And remember to check your email for the 2022 community lecture series. And please uh, join us for any of those. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Fareed. Thank you, Dr. Mai. We appreciate the time you took to um, give us such a great lecture this evening. Uh, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Be well, all. Thank Have you. Bye-bye.